Mercy. Mercy me. Nothing personal word of the day. March 2nd. Got through the first day of March. It's now March 2nd, 2021. Mercy is the word of the day. We've got a new rule in baseball alert. Co, could we have music for that? New rule in baseball alert. Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. That's Morse code. You know what that means? Ready? Do, 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 ding, ping, do, 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 ding, ding. That means baseball changed the rule and people are up in arms. I wish everyone would just relax. Man on second in the 10th inning. It's good. Three batter minimum. I like it. Doesn't really matter much. Universal DH. Uh, no, not anymore. Expanded playoffs. Nah, not quite yet. Maybe again. We've got a mercy rule, finally, for the love of God. Here was my idea of a mercy rule back in the day. Back in my day in Major League Baseball, we talked about the Little League rule. If anyone's up or down by 10 runs, how about that? Mercy me. The union said, no chance, because that's when we get stats. That's when we get a big three-run home run to make it 12-5 to five with two outs in the ninth. And that's good because when a player hits free agency or arbitration, they've got an extra three-run home run. Three more ribbies. How about a mercy rule when you just say, you know what? That's it. It doesn't have to be 10 runs. It's up to any team to say at any point, I'm going full Roberto Duran. That's it. No mas. No, couldn't get that passed either because there was a thought that owners would just have a dinner reservation. They'd be losing. They'd be pissed off that their top pitcher would be giving up runs. And they just say, end the game. We're done. Now, there's another mercy rule that started yesterday. It's a spring training mercy rule, except it's not a mercy rule. So why is the word of the day mercy? It's a spring training doesn't matter except for preparation rule, which is what we talked about a nothing personal yesterday rule. It was used for the first time by Garrett Richards, new pitcher for the Red Sox, got $10 million for one year to pitch for the Red Sox. $10 million. Coca, how many starts does Garrett Richards have in the last two years? $10 million, $8 million in salary plus a $1.5 million buyout if they don't pick up the team option, which I don't think they're going to pick up the team option. Garrett Richards takes the mound for the first spring training game. The rule is the manager of a team, of the fielding team, after his pitcher has thrown 20 pitches, has the right to end the inning right then and there. So Garrett Richards is on the mound. The guy who has 13 starts the past two years. If you're a pitcher who's healthy, you get 70 starts over two years if you're performing and healthy. 13 starts over two years is not bad. It's worse bad. It's really, really bad. So Garrett yeah, Richards gets on the mound. Everyone's excited. Alex Cora, first game back after being in the penalty box for a year because the sign stealing scandal puts on the uniform goes to the dugout, out goes Garrett Richards. First inning, no out. Pitch, 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 run, pitch, pitch, no out, pitch, one out, pitch, pitch. All of a sudden, Alex Cora says, that's it. The inning's over. He threw his 20 pitches. We're ending the inning right now. <laughs> the Red Sox go to hit. Second inning. I'm sorry, am I seeing, am I, wait? That's Garrett Richards pitching. Garrett Richards pitches the second inning, goes one, two, three, leaves the game, meets the media. Alex Cora says, he's our guy. We're not worried at all. It's a great rule. There was no reason for him to throw more than 20 pitches in an inning. It was very important to us that he came out and gave us that clean second inning. I like it. That's what we tell the media. That's what we tell our fans. When there's a one, two, three, it's clean. Everything was clean. Don't worry that we're looking at his mechanics. Don't worry that we're looking at his pitch selection. Don't worry that we're looking at his execution. But a ground ball happened to find a defender, and the wind kept the fly ball in the ballpark, but it was clean. So we get to say that to fans. 
to make us feel better about our free agent signing, to make us feel better that we have a chance to win games. The type of stuff that Alex Cora said after the first spring training game, you're not going to hear during the regular season, of course, because the regular season actually matters. So what's my view of this mercy rule in spring training? It's about time. Are you betting on spring training games, any of you? Please don't. Please wait for me to do picks of the day during the regular season. Stick with the NBA. Just don't. Because when you've got a mercy rule like this, I want you to picture what can happen. There can be four runs in, bases loaded, no outs, the over-under is five. It's the end of the game. And all of a sudden, guess what happens? Game over. Mercy rule. We're ending the inning. Managers during this spring training can end a game in seven innings if they want, except for the last week of this spring training. But they can say, we're done. No more pitchers. Remember, it used to be F9. Tie game in spring training is when they would just end the game. We would pre-decide that with the opposing team's manager before the game. We got enough pitchers for nine today. We're not going 10 no matter what. The game ends in a tie. The fans are in the ballpark. We never announced anything to the fans. Why? Don't get me started on how much we penalize fans for going to games. They don't know what the replay is. They don't know what's being replayed. They don't know when a game's going to end, going to start. They don't know when a rain delay is going to end, start. They don't know anything. Can't upset the umpires. Can't talk to fans in the stands. I'm going on a rant totally off subject, Coca, because I'm annoyed with it. But in any case, the mercy rule happened. Look forward to another spring training games. Don't bet the spring training games because you don't know what's going to happen. Forget the fact that you don't know the result. You really don't know what's going to happen in any particular inning. These types of rule changes that baseball is implementing are just starting. You are going to see over the next couple of years, numerous changes that inure to the benefit of player health. And the reason why we are so, we dollar coca dollar, The reason why they are so focused on player health is once a year at an owner's meeting, up comes someone in the labor relations department. They go to the front of the room. They collate their papers on the desk in front of them. They put their papers down. All right, we're ready for slide one. It's it's always someone named John or Jane or somebody who's running the slides. Slide one. And we'd look at it and I'd be taking copious notes during the owner's meeting until finally someone from the LRD labor relations department says, we will send you a copy of this presentation. Few, I can stop taking notes. I feel like I'm in law school. Slide one, I'm looking at it. Oh no, don't be the Marlins. Don't be the Marlins, please. That's the one thing during an owner's meeting you do not wanna see your team in any slides unless it's because you've done well in arbitration and won the arbitration belt but this is about injuries, disabled list, amount of money on the disabled list as a percentage of total payroll, amount of money on the disabled list as a percentage of payroll in the entire industry, notional amount of money on the disabled list by team. The Marlins would never be on top of that because the Yankees would when you've got a $200 million payroll and $100 million of your guys are on the disabled list. Here's how you do the math. If you have a player who makes a million dollars a game, $162 million a year is his salary. He's on the DL for 10 days. It's now called the IL. He is making $10 million for those 10 days on the IL. That 10 million, you might as well flush it down the crap because that player's not playing for you. So you've got $10 million on the disabled list. $10 $10 million of what in football they call dead cap money. This isn't cap money. It's just dead money. What they don't count is the replacement cost of that player who's on the DL. I always counted that in a separate line item on the budget. We would call it disabled list player replacement salary. What do I mean? When you have to bring up a minor leaguer who's making 600 bucks a week and you have to bring them up to the big leagues, to replace an injured player, and he makes the pro-rated, let's say it's $1.62 million, which it's not, the minimum is a third of that, 600 grand, but just say it is, and he's up there for 10 days, he's making some real money, and you have to add that up. 
So the sheet would be distributed and teams have had enough. Owners have had enough. No more injuries. Too much weightlifting. Stop weightlifting. Too many steroids. Stop it. It's hurting your knees and your back. Better reclining seats on a plane to help your back and your legs. Better recovery. But players are throwing 98 right now. They're supposed to play 162 games in 185 days. It's too much. Too many injuries. So in spring training, as we are trying to start a season without injuries, rules will happen that will diminish the likelihood of any sort of injury while keeping what has analytically been proven keeping the build up toward the regular season for position players and pitchers, as we discussed yesterday. That's why Garrett Richards was taken out of the first inning and then put back in the second inning, because that's how to get a pitcher ready. Now, Garrett Richards does not deserve the benefit of any doubt by Alex Cora saying that he's our guy. We're good. He's going to pitch. Everything's fine. Nobody panic. I agree. You don't panic after game one. We said that. I agree that you want to hope if you're the Red Sox, that Garrett Richards is going to perform. But what's the likelihood, I ask you? The Red Sox are not going to be a force to be reckoned with in the AL East. You've got the Yankees. You've got the Rays. You've got the Jays. You've got the Orioles and Red Sox finishing in fourth and fifth, I would imagine. But we're not up to predictions, but we are up to the New York Metropolitans because they're my favorite topic right now. Back page of the New York paper this morning saying how Steve Cohn is operating this right not getting involved, taking a step back and letting others be in charge. No new owneritis. Say not like the Wilpons where they were all meddling. All these writers and everyone writing about the Mets, they don't know one thing about how the Mets were actually run or how every other team is actually run. And if Steve Cohn is snowing you by saying that he's not involved and he's taking a total step back and there to just watch spring training with a smile on his face, hands on his hips, that's because... There are cameras and they're watching him. The reality is that he brought in Sandy Alderson, but every decision the Mets made this off season, every single one was done with Steve Cohn's blessing at Steve Cohn's direction. So Sandy Alderson meets the media yesterday. That's what GMs have to do when spring training starts. So I think he's the president now. I think he's both the president of business and baseball operations, which I can only tell you is impossible. You cannot do both those jobs, but don't worry. They've got Jake Porter to be their GM, so they're going to be just fine. Don't at me at David P. Sampson. I know that Porter was fired. I'm aware of it, okay? It was a joke. Sandy Alderson can't do both, but he did have time to meet the media, and Mets fans are dancing in the streets with Mick Jagger, who turned 77. Oh, my God. Coca, can you confirm that? Is Mick Jagger 77 years old? Mick Jagger, the lead singer of the Rolling Stones, will be dancing in the streets. The Mets fans are dancing, listening to Sandy Alderson talk about George Springer. Remember George Springer, the guy in the Blue Jays who signed the six-year deal? He used to be on the Astros. George Springer... So it's, uh, he was one of the three free agents who I assumed the Mets would sign. Bauer, JT Realmuto, George Springer. At least one of three. I said two of three. They got zero of three. Sandy Alderson was immediately asked about it. And he said one of the great lines. We were all in. I mean, we were in. But when it got to six years, we were out. We thought five years was right, not six years. Hmm. Just trying to see if that makes sense to me. Sandy said, I think it all came down to five years versus six. In our case, we had to be constantly aware of players already on the team who were going to be in a similar position. Okay, that's every team every year. When you sign a free agent, there's always a younger player who could eventually take the place of the free agent. Obviously, OBS. How many of those deals we could expect to negotiate and actually complete, he said, and not absolutely hamstring ourselves going forward. Had we signed Springer, here it comes, the money quote. It's probably less likely that we would be able to re-sign Michael Conforto, for example. And at some point, 
dun 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 dun. Even Steve Cohn runs out of money. So one thing that I would tell our PR department and our president of baseball operations, GM, we're not discussing the amount of money the owner has. It is not relevant. We are discussing running a business. Doesn't have to be profitable every year, but it certainly has to be break even because the aptitude to lose money is there, but the inclination should not be. Remember Bud Selig's famous line, you stress yourself out 162 games a year. If you're a good team, you go to bed 70 nights a year, miserable, miserable. And then on top of that, you're going to write a check at the end of the year. Are you guys out of your minds? That's what he would always say. But you cannot say that your owner is going to run out of money because everyone's going to play the world's tiniest violin for him. Oh, he's got $14 billion. I read he's got $14 billion. Is that liquid or is that only in the value of, of illiquid assets that he can't use anyway? But let's say it's half liquid, half illiquid. He's got $7 billion. He's going to run out of money by having a payroll of $200 million versus $220. That's an extra $20 million a year plus the tax. Let's say that's $20 million. That's $40 million a year. Let's multiply that by two and add 20 and say that he's a hundred million dollars over where he was going to be every single year. And then just for fun, let's say he doubles it again because he wanted to sign everyone and pay for old team presidents who've been fired and give them a ton of money too, just to be a consultant. All right. We're now at $300 million of payroll, $200 million of losses every year. All right, 200, 400, 600, 800, 1 billion. That means every five years, he'll lose $1 billion. Let's say he only has $7 billion. That's it. Seven times one, two, three, four. 35 years after running the team at a $300 million payroll with $200 million of losses, he will run out of money, assuming he only has $7 billion. Now, of course, I am being completely, completely naive in telling you that he doesn't need money to operate his boat to buy art. It's got great art, great art, great taste in art, by the way, Steve Cohen has. So let's pretend that on top of the $300 million in payroll, which is $200 million in losses, on top of that to run his life, it's another $200 million a year to run his life, to go to, to fly back and forth from here to there, to get good seats whenever he wants to go to a show, to operate some of his other properties to this, to that, 200 more million dollars of expenses. He's got to do his lawn, right? He's got to get his pool cleaned. Okay, now we're up to $400 million of losses, assuming no other revenue. The other $7 billion in liquid assets is not generating any rate of return. He's not investing in GameStop or AMC. He's not investing in Top Shot. He's not buying digital art. He's doing none of that stuff. We're up to $400 million of losses. Four, eight, 12, 16, 20, rut row. That means that's $2 billion every five years. He only has $7 billion, 2 billion every five years. Means after 10 years, he's down four. He can get about 17 years running the team and then he's out, out of money. Are you getting my point yet? Don't ever say when you're meeting the media that your owner, even your owner could run out of money because he's so rich. Don't do it. You lose your credibility, Sandy because we just did the math on nothing personal. He's not going to run out of money. There's no chance. Just say that Steve Cohn, as an owner in his first year, has let me, Sandy Alderson, advise him what makes sense. And I made the decision that George Springer in the sixth year of his contract is going to suck. Do you understand the absurdity of that? And do you understand the reason I think it's absurd is because I'm the one who gave extra years to everyone. And when you get to the extra year, it sucks. I get it. When you've got way in Chen at $22 million that you have to pay, not me, but let's say someone has to pay like Jeter. That sucks. I get it. But when you tell your fan base, you're a new owner, you're going to win the World Series in the first three to five years. And then you say you're upset and worried about year six because it'll impact the fact that you may have to re-sign Michael Conforto. And what's he going to be making that same year six? You'll have too much money for too many position players. I don't see San Diego worrying about that right now. They're going to have to, but they're not right now. But they're not the Mets. If you're going to act like a large revenue team and a large market team, then the sixth year does not matter. That doesn't make me a bad ex-team president. It makes me a smart one. You've got to come up with a better reason. 
I think. Unless you just have pictures of your owner with a goat, in which case you don't have to win games or come up with good reasons. I guess that's possible too. <sighs> it's really hard to keep a job. I mean, not for Coca. Not for nothing personal because of you all. Thank you for downloading and subscribing. You've done it. Thank you. If you didn't listen to the end of the show yesterday, you'll get to it. Nothing personal is back. We are back and better than ever. Every day we get better because of you. We keep interacting with you. We do Clubhouse every Thursday night. That'll be fun. Come into the Clubhouse room. We're going to have another 10-minute talk on a subject that interests you because you gave it to me. Last week, we did how to make a budget. This week, we're going to choose another one of your subjects that you asked me to talk about. And then we're going to open it all the questions like we did last week. That's fun. Interacting with you on Twitter, David P. Sampson's fun, but very, very tough for someone who's OCD who doesn't sleep because now I sleep less and I'm trying to answer as many DMs as possible. A lot of news. Thank you, though, for supporting Nothing Personal. We're going to keep going because every day something happens all the time. The Atlanta Hawks are a team that I've loved because they had Tom McMillan on the team. I found it fascinating that a man with gray hair could be in the NBA. Loved it. The human highlight film, Dominique Wilkins, Spud Webb, my guy. Spud Webb is only an inch and a half taller than I am. Well, you're going to say that that's wrong because I told you I'm 5'5 and Spud Webb's listed at 5'7, but I've seen Spud Webb up close. He's about an inch and a half taller than I. Can you believe Muggsy Bogues is shorter than I? It's almost insane. Anyway, I can't jump, as you may imagine. So I've liked the Hawks for a while. And one of the things that interests me after they had an ownership change is Jamie Gertz's husband bought the team. I've always been a big fan of Jamie Gertz from less than zero. She was cousins with Allie Gertz, someone I went to high school with. One of the first during the AIDS epidemic and AIDS crisis of the 80s, she died of AIDS. Her name's Allie Gertz. If you don't know her story, you should. And it makes me sad that her story may not get enough attention. She was two years older. I had the biggest crush on her and she thought I was this cute little kid. So I get to hang out with her and all of her other beautiful friends and fun friends and I didn't get to party with her at Studio 54 or anything like that. But anyway, Jamie Gertz, if you've watched the NBA lottery, Jamie Gertz is the one who represents the Hawks all the time at the lottery. They're always in the lottery, but their expectations this year were to be better. They've got uh, Neil Young. Neil Young is the singer. They definitely don't have Neil Young. They have uh, Trey Young. Is it possible that's his first name? Um, there's too many names. Who can remember? Trey Young. Yes, Coca. They were supposed to be better. They have not in any way had a decent start to the season. What do you do when you are starting a season and you had unrealistic expectations and those expectations don't get met? It's very, very simple what you do. You fire your coach. So there was a coach named Lloyd Pierce who coached the Hawks. And just yesterday he was fired. And what interests me about this story is twofold. One, Players are saying they found out about his firing from Twitter. Not good. Not good. Even in this day and age, you got to get to your players. The players were fiercely loyal to Lloyd Pierce, but that's not the only group who was loyal to Lloyd Pierce. His assistant coaches were fiercely loyal to Lloyd Pierce, one of whom is named Nate McMillan. Nate McMillan, you may remember, is the former guard for the uh, Seattle Supersonics former head coach of the Indiana Pacers. He was now the top assistant of the Atlanta Hawks. So the firing happened and they really didn't have a good plan for who was going to coach. Which, by the way, is a bad plan. As you know, they didn't call me. I would have told them how to fire someone. So what had to be announced is that Pierce is fired. And the hope is Nate McMillan will be the interim coach, but he has not accepted to be the interim coach. He has not accepted to be the full-time head coach because he is so fiercely loyal to Lloyd Pierce. He was not going to do anything before speaking to Lloyd Pierce, who had recently been fired. Nate McMillan speaks to Lloyd Pierce. Lloyd Pierce says to Nate McMillan, I got you. Please be the interim. I appreciate your loyalty. I really do. But please make this team better. 
Nate McMillan then says late last night, I'll be the interim coach. It's so sloppily done that it's as though these owners had never read the textbook on how to fire a coach. It seems very bizarre to me that that would be the case. So the process needed to be slightly different. When you've had enough of your coach and you know that you want to bring up his loyal assistant coach to be your interim, you've got to talk to your head coach and your interim coach concurrently. Divide and conquer. In one room, you are letting Lloyd Pierce go. In the other room, you are telling Nate McMillan, and you are then giving them a time to meet right then and there because you've told Nate McMillan what the plan is. You've told Lloyd Pierce what the man is, what the plan is, and you have allowed them to get together and talk right then and there, fully masked, six feet away, because then you get to make one announcement. This is the move that we are making. Just sloppy. And then the quote from the Hawks is something I don't understand. You have to always say we want to, we would like to thank Lloyd for his work and commitment to not only the Hawks organization, but the city of Atlanta. (sighs) Okay. Does that mean he's going to stay in Atlanta? If he becomes a head coach in Kalamazoo, I'm not sure he's going to stay around Atlanta, but he had a commitment. He did all the required community appearances. Thank you, Lloyd. Way to go. And then the owner Schlank continued. His name is Schlank. We have high expectations for our team on the court, not off the court, just on the court. Don't say on the court when you have high expectations. Just say we have high expectations for our team. Because if you say on the court, that means you don't really care what happens off the court. And in this day and age, that could lead to just a little bit of canceling and a little bit of problems. So you could say we we have high expectations for our team, both on the court and off the court. But that means You just have high expectations. Fewer words are better than more words. Just say, we have high expectations for our team. And here comes the line from page two of the playbook, not page one, page two. We believe by making this change now that we can have a strong second half of the season. OMG. I've used that line before. When we fired Torborg and brought in Jack, that was the line that we used. It's still early in the campaign, and we think that Jack is the guy to get the most of our players and turn this team around. Of course, we then won a ring. Jack had the golden touch. (laughs) He certainly did in 03. Not as much in 04 and 05, but definitely in 03. Making this change now, the Hawks said, means we can have a strong second half of the season. So in basketball, unlike baseball, I'm not a big believer in the whole, the coach will get everyone kumbaya playing together. Basketball, I believe you actually have to have good players. In baseball, you can have players who are all okay, no superstars, and they can all get hot. They can all play as a team. You get momentum. I just think it's much harder in the NBA for that to happen, which is such a star-driven league. The Hawks have one star who's not ready to win. They do not have what it takes to do anything other than maybe sneak into the back door of the playoffs, but even that seems unlikely. So I don't understand what would have happened that the Atlanta Hawks ownership said today is the day. They had to give the excuse that we're about to go on the all-star break and we want to give Nate McMillan, wait a minute, Nate McMillan's been there. Nate McMillan knows exactly what the schemes are. He knows what the plays are. Oh, I get it. Nate McMillan, who's very loyal to Pierce, the erstwhile coach is going to institute a brand new season and he's going to take the microphone and believe me, he will. And he will meet the media and he will have to be super careful because he doesn't want to do anything to throw shade at Pierce because Pierce is his guy. So instead, he's going to have to talk about other things that he's going to do. He can't say, hey, we need more discipline. Hey, he's going to speak in platitudes, metaphors. All I know is that we're going to be out there working hard every night. That sort of means they weren't working hard before for your coach that you love so much. So even that statement is problematic. Let me try another one. Nate McMillan meets the media. All I know is that I want to help put these players in the best position possible to win. Have you ever heard that one before? Ooh, that one sucks too, because that means the previous coach put them in the best position possible to lose. All right, let me try one more. Here we go. Hi, I'm Nate McMillan. This is a bittersweet day for me. 
You have to say that because you don't want to say that you're happy because how can you be happy that you're the head coach when the only reason you're the head coach is your best friend or your good friend? Maybe you're not friends at all, but the one you were loyal to got fired. So you can't say that. All right, let me try one more time. Hi, I'm Nate McMillan. Obviously an unfortunate day for the organization. Good, stick with that. I will always be thankful that I was able to work with Pierce. Good, stick with that. I spoke to Pierce and he was okay with me becoming the interim coach. Say that. All I can tell you is I will work with these players and try to continue what has been started under Coach Pierce. That's what he is going to say. And if you're the owner, what you're hearing is, uh oh, <laughs> we've got a problem. He's going to continue what was going on under the previous head coach. What was going on under the previous head coach is we were in the damn lottery every year. And I got to stare at Jamie Gertz, hoping that the right ball would come out. Hmm. That's it for Atlanta. <laughs> All right. Speaking of Atlanta, how was the nothing personal pick of the day? Were you guys nervous yesterday? Because we're hot. We are H O triple T. H-O triple T. We are 10 games over, 28 and 18. Didn't think it was possible. Did you know what happened in last night's Mavericks game when we said that the Magic would cover? They were getting seven from the Mavericks. And Luka missed a free throw and they won 130 to 124. Yahtzee. We just got six sixes. We are 28 and 18. We're going to keep going in the NBA. Why wouldn't we? I was going to do a spring training game just for S's and G's. And just to see whether there'd be a mercy rule and to show you how impossible it is to actually choose a spring training game. We could do a bonus spring training game, but not going to do it because when we do a bonus game and it loses, it counts as a loss. So we're back in the NBA and we're at the Miami Heat who are really playing well. They're sort of playing like the bubble team right now. You got Jimmy and Bam. They're playing the Atlanta Hawks. And here's the thing about the Hawks. And the reason I'm checking is I want to get an exact updated line right now, because when I give a line on the show, Coca gets annoyed with me because when the line changes, I want to change it too, but we can't change the line. So here is the actual heat Hawks line. The heat are giving three and a half points only. I thought it was going to be six and a half. That can't be right. Coca heat three and a half over the Hawks. Oh God. Hawks under new coach, Nate McMillan. Do you know what that's called? I just figured it out. I just figured it out. And that's why we're taking the game. It's the new coach line change. Things are going to happen. New schemes, new plays, new motivation. We want to do it for Nate. Heat by three and a half over the Hawks. When we come back, we're going to review the winner of the best foreign language film. But don't shut off nothing personal because this movie will be well worth it. And we're going to talk about the Wisconsin badges and whether or not J.J. Watt is going to make a tiny little donation to the University of Wisconsin, being one of the most generous people in the NFL. We will be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. My name is David Sampson. Hope you're all doing well on this Friday, March 2nd, 2021. And I... Coca does not feel like a Friday to me. What day is it today, Coca? Checking, checking, two. <laughs> Off by three days. I was about to say it's not Friday, it's Pizza Wednesday, but it turns out it's actually just Tuesday. <sighs> we review a movie every day. We watch a movie every day. I came across a movie, I'm not going to review it right now, late last night, that you're going to hear me review later called Kodachrome, but we're not going to talk about that. We're talking about Minari. It's Oscar season. It's Golden Globe season. I've got to watch movies that are nominated and that win, and I want to give you suggestions as to what to watch. Minari is about a Korean family, farming family, who ends up in Arkansas, and it's how they adjust to life in Arkansas as immigrants. It's mostly in Korean. There is some English, including the part of the Korean farmer's partner, helper, played by Will Patton. Will Patton played Wes Bentley's father in Yellowstone as sort of a schleppy looking guy. Will Patton plays a God-fearing, hugely religious Christ guy 
farmer in the movie Minari. And he also looks schleppy, which is amazing because I know Will Patton from No Way Out when he was the button up aide to Gene Hackman. I see, doctor. That was a uh, great movie if you haven't seen No Way Out. Anyway, so Will Patton's in it. He speaks English in the movie. The subtitles are easy to read. The movie is beautifully done, perfectly directed, perfectly written. The cinematography is unbelievable. The struggles that I cannot in any way pretend to talk about. You know, this reminds me of something, Coca. Just because I haven't experienced something doesn't mean I can't try to empathize or try to understand, but it just means in coming off 2020, this is very critical, a very critical point. I just don't have the ability to tell you that I have walked in someone else's shoes. I've never been an immigrant. I've, ne <clears throat> I've never been a farmer. I've never had a worry. Excuse me. I have a new soundboard from CBS. Once we signed the new contract, they sent this amazing soundboard. It's sort of like getting deflated basketballs when they don't know if you're going to sign with the team long term. And then when you sign, all of a sudden you get these real basketballs that bounce super well. Or in tennis, when the game's going to continue, new balls, please. So we got the new soundboard. Coke and I spent at least an hour trying to figure out. Coca couldn't help me because Coca's not here because we're still not here together. So I have a few buttons in a few places, but by tomorrow, I'm going to know what to press, what not to press. Frankly, there's a chance you haven't heard the entire show, or there's a chance you just heard the cough. I'm not sure at all. And I'm not even sure if the microphone works. My earpiece doesn't work, so Coca can't even talk to me during the show. So he's just writing stuff. Like he wrote earlier in the show, he turned 78 in July. I'm supposed to read that and tell you someone turned 78 in July. I assume, he, I assume he meant Garrett Richards. He may have meant Sandy Alderson. He could have meant Carlos Carrasco or maybe Lloyd Pierce or Nate McMillan. I think those are the people we talked about. In any case, we're getting back to Minari. So I cannot tell you that I've walked in the shoes of what it would be like to be in a foreign country trying to make a go of it without speaking the language. When I went to Paris and made a go of the newspaper business, I at least had a working understanding of French, and it's not exactly like I had to sell a paper in order to eat a piece of pizza pino or to get a crescent. That's a croissant for those of you in the know, not the Napoleon Dynamite crescent. So Minari is this movie that not enough people are seeing. For whatever reason, a movie that is not in English cannot be nominated for some reason for best picture, or it can only be in the best foreign language picture category, it can also then be in the best picture category. This deserves to have a nod come Oscar time. It is one of the top 10 movies of the year. The grandmother should be nominated for a best supporting actress, and she speaks maybe two words of English but she, she spoke with her eyes. She spoke Korean. She spoke with subtitles. If you have a chance to watch Minari, and I don't often tell you to go for $19.99. I really don't. If you can get the movie another way, don't tell me you're doing that, but do it, but don't tell me you're doing it. You could do it, but don't say it because I want the movie people who make movies to make sure they get paid. That's why I don't like stealing music off the inter Google. I like singing music and getting into trouble. I like playing music on my phone and then getting a letter saying that we can't play that music anymore because we're in violation of six codes of the USC, United States Code. Minari is the movie. All right, we're up to On Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. That's the song. We, you know, there's a story that I wanted to talk about today. It didn't make the show today, but I think it'll make the show tomorrow about the, the Texas song. Fascinating story, actually. But now we're talking about Wisconsin. We're talking about J.J. Watt. J.J. Watt made the news, and I am confused. I am very confused. J.J. Watt is not Deshaun Watson. Let's start with that. J.J. Watt is not one of the top defensive ends in football. Are we clear on this, that I love him? He's a badger. When he wanted out of Houston, Houston wanted him out of Houston because if they had kept him, they would have given him $17 million and they were able to save some cap space by giving him his release. And then he went on this big kick. Where am I going to play? All these teams wanted him. Could he go to Green Bay? That'd be fun. Could he go to Tennessee? That'd be interesting. Where's he going to go? 
Well, he announced on his own social media that he's signing a deal with the Phoenix Cardinals. That didn't sound right. What is the name of the Cardinals team? The Arizona Cardinals. Or is it the Phoenix Cardinals? I don't know what's in my head right now. In any case, it doesn't much matter. J.J. Watt is going to Arizona. He got 21. He got two years, $31 million. It's impossible to believe. I said to myself, if they gave him 31 over two, my guess is maybe 10 of that is guaranteed. They'll give him 10 million to play in a year. And then they'll realize he's still ineffective and he's way too old, which is too bad. He's a definite Hall of Famer. And then the Cardinals gave him $23 million guaranteed. 23 of the $31 million is guaranteed. What in the name of holy crap is going on? It is one of the great overpays of all time. Not of all time. That's hyperbole. Stop being hyperbolic with only five minutes left in the show. It's an overpay. And that's fine. The Cardinals feel they want to reunite him. What's, who are they reuniting with, Coke? Is it DeAndre Hopkins? Playing with Kyler Murray. Maybe they'll get to play some baseball on the side. Do you think the Cardinals have a more likely chance to win a Super Bowl with J.J. Watt than without J.J. Watt? They're going to sell some jerseys. They're going to get some excitement. He's going to do his workouts on Instagram with his Cardinals swag. But the real losers of the J.J. Watt to the Cardinals are some men and women who are making about fifty dollars to $60,000 a year and work in PR departments for teams. I'm very worried as a team president, how I would staff a PR department were I still to be a team president. Because it turns out that we don't need as big a department because the way you release information now, half the time the player does it. You need more people in social media because you do everything through social media. And frankly, this makes me sound like a boomer coca, but frankly, a lot of young people just don't know how to write statements anymore. They don't know how to put three sentences together, to make a paragraph because they talk in characters. They talk in LOLs and BRBs and STQs and LSDs. So if I'm a player, here's what I would be telling myself. And if I were an agent, here's what I'd be telling my players. Take control of your own brand. Take control of your own message. Take control of your own narrative. You're going to break the news. Remember what Trevor Bauer did when he was signed by the Dodgers? And his website released Mets garb that he was going to sell, making people think he was on the Mets. And then he had to apologize to the Mets because he went to the Dodgers, not the Mets, because the Dodgers offered him to be the highest paid player this year and next year. And I never criticized Trevor Bauer for having his own website. I never criticized Trevor Bauer for trying to build his own brand. I just said he may not have done it the right way. J.J. Watt is also doing that. And when you are building your own brand, you build up the crescendo of excitement. Where am I going to sign? Where am I going to sign? Here's the problem with building up your own brand and sort of taking away the reason for team PR departments with your team is that if you don't perform, your brand suffers. If your team stinks, but you're good, your brand can be okay. If your team's good and you stink, your brand can be okay. If your team stinks and you stink, then you got a problem. That's one of the four quadrants. You know, I like talking in quadrants. One quadrant, team, you both stink. Doesn't matter that you're on social media. Doesn't matter that you're releasing statements. Doesn't matter that you're trying to control your brand or narrative. No one cares about losers. No one cares. So running a team right now would cause me, I think, to switch my allocation of budget into social media, out of PR, out of PR interns, into social media interns. I think the future of sports, if not all business, is going to be a dearth of PR departments because the traditional ways that they've been taught and that I was taught just don't apply anymore. And so when young people are rising through the ranks, they are rising through the ranks with an unbelievable knowledge and capacity to handle social media. The problem is when you have something like social media that is immediate, you lose the ability to double check. You lose the ability to make sure you don't make mistakes. And believe me, when you are on social media, it is only a matter of when, not if. 
Mistakes will be made that will cause a firing, a canceling, or an embarrassing situation. It's interesting running businesses these days. It certainly is. When it comes to figuring out where you're going to spend your time, when it comes to figuring out whether or not you should bring in J.J. Watt to sell a few extra jerseys, it's very simple what the equation is. It's just business. It's nothing personal. 